I would like to speak to you this morning using as a text Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. <clears throat> Mark 12, verses 28 through 31. While you're turning there, I think it's important to emphasize that the whole idea behind this sermon is to study what God says about man's duty to himself, man's duty to himself. Now, the whole approach to this is that to show that man has duties to God, to his neighbor, and to himself with emphasis upon the thought that this duty to himself will fully involve his duty to God and to his neighbor. So I trust that as we go through Mark 12, 28 through 31, that this will give us a deeper understanding and appreciation for man's duty to himself. We're talking about then the area of character building. So let's go over to Mark 12, 28 through 31. Mark 12, 28 through 31. And notice what he said here. It's marked by inspiration. The Holy Spirit records it. And one of the scribes came. And having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Now let's just look at this text for a moment. It was on a Tuesday in the week of the crucifixion of our Lord when these events transpired. And of course the Lord's enemies, as they did so often, were striving to find something of which to accuse him. You remember that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, combining their official positions as members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, had already challenged the authority of Jesus in Mark 11, 27 through 32. This is setting the context of these verses we've read. The council then sent the Pharisees along with the Herodians and they questioned the Lord about paying tribute to Caesar. That's in chapter 12, 13 through 17. And following these came the Sadducees. Well, they didn't believe in spirits, angels, or the resurrection, so they questioned him about the resurrection. Mark 12, verses 18 through 27. Thereafter, one of the scribes, a lawyer, asked him then about the first commandment. And that's what we just read about. And that covers actually Mark 12 all the way from verse 28 through actually 34. Now, our lesson takes place following what our Lord said that we read to you a moment ago. It was, in other words, in response to the lawyer's question that the Lord said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. 
And the second is like to it, thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Then the Lord explained further, there is none commandment greater than these. I would let that sink into my mind as we go through this business of studying man's duty to himself and what all that involves. Now, in the Lord's response to the lawyer, he calls attention to the basic thought that we've already mentioned in the beginning. Man has duties to God, to his neighbor, and to himself. Now, oftentimes I use the terms, as others do, our obligations to God. Well, our duties come out of our obligations. I have a duty to do thus and so because I'm obligated to do thus and so. So based on the background I've just given you, let's pursue the study of man's duty to himself. As we look at these verses, they reveal to us, number one, that man has duties to God. We're obligated by God to do certain things. Now we find uh, usually we're talking about obeying God's commandments. And we learn from Ecclesiastes that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. And that's always the case. From the beginning, all the way down through the patriarchal age, the mosaical dispensation, and now for about 2,000 years, the New Testament teaching of Christ we have the obligations to do what God said do. To do what he said do in the way he said do it, if he did say do it in a certain way. And with the right reasons for doing it. Maybe there's only one, maybe there's more than one reason. We have that kind of particularness in our approach to discharging our duties to God, to obeying God. First of all, we recognize that one of those duties is man must believe in God. Jesus said in John 14, 1, you believe in God, speaking to the Jews, of course they did. But then he says, believe also in me. And Hebrews 11 in verse 6 makes it clear, but without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe. There's our duty, there's our obligation. Must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Now there's no use trying to say, I believe in God, if your idea of belief doesn't lead you, in every case, to render obedience to God. Remember Hebrews 5, 9, Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So man... Mankind, human beings, created in the image of God, that is our very spirits are fathered by God, must recognize, and in recognizing it, must fully appreciate God as creator, as maker, as sustainer, as the only true guide in how to live this life on earth so heaven will be our home. Now, we could point out a number of passages of Scripture that bring this out. But I would just say, in general, when you read the revelation of God's mind to us, the whole Bible, then in one way or the other, to one extent or the other, it's always saying that man has duties to God. Those duties changed according to the commandments of God. People approach God, approach God in a different way under patriarchal dispensation than they did as the Jews did under the law of Moses or as Christians do under the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. But the attitude is always, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. No matter what it is that I understand God obligates me to do, I will discharge that duty. Well, that may get you in trouble. I will still discharge that duty. That may get you put in jail. I will still obey God. It may get you thrown in a fiery furnace. I'll still obey God. So man must seek to know God and to do his will. We have as the prime example Jesus Christ. 
when he became a man, he subjected himself to the Father to do what was necessary as a man to save each one of us and all mankind from our sins if we're to be saved. And thus, over and over again, you see Christ talking about how he always did what his Father wanted him to do. And we see then Paul saying to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And you see, the Bereans commended because they were more noble than those of Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. So a man must seek to know God and his will. See, God blessed us with having the capabilities of knowing and how we come to know anything. Well, if he has said that your duty is to know God, I can know God. If you read Acts 17, he speaks to people who were pagans, philosophers, and idolaters. And yet he says God wants to be found. He's not far from anybody. And uh, I saw as I passed by your devotions to all these gods, here's one to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you about him. And he did. He said about it preaching. And this tells us as the church, and we're under obligation, there's our duty again to God to preach the gospel to every creature. It tells me that I must recognize the state people are in when I approach them to teach them about their duty to God. And it'll all come back to their understanding their duty to themselves. So we see that it's not a matter of just knowing what God says or saying God exists and Jesus is the Son of God. It is that man must do God's will. I cannot overly emphasize that God has always required obedience. It's obvious at the end of time when our Lord returns in flaming fire, he'll come taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I've already uh, reminded you of Hebrews 5, 9 where the scripture says, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. We must worship God. Now, there are people gathered around all over this country today who engage in what they call worship of God. Most of it is worship of God, such as Cain involved himself in. While the person that says Cain didn't worship God just doesn't know what he's talking about. But his worship was not acceptable to God. I don't know what all went on in the mind of Cain, except he was a very self-willed person. He was a tiller of the ground, so he brought vegetables or whatever he raised and said, I'll offer them to God. Well, he took time to erect an altar, and probably I wouldn't doubt that he had the best vegetables out of his uh, soil that he'd raised, but it was unacceptable. I, don't, I wouldn't argue with you as to how deeply sincere he was, but it didn't accomplish anything. Because God had given them direction of how he wanted to be worshipped, and it seems that those who want to many times claim to serve and worship God is that they want to tell God how they want to worship him. He ought to be happy about that. But God has revealed how he wanted to be worshiped. And when I come to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 in the New Testament, Abel is the one that's held up as one who lived by faith. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So therefore, those boys were instructed. As to how God wanted to be worshipped. Abel obeyed him. Cain didn't. So it is always all over the place. People say God is. Christ is the son of God. We love him so much. The Bible is the word of God. And we'll just offer about anything. And call it worship. And God's all happy with that. That has never been the case. And no way does the Bible teach any such thing. With the patriarchal age. Mosaical age or under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. But nevertheless, we are to worship. These are acts of devotion that we, whereby we show God our adoration of Him. Well, I don't know anything about those acts of devotion before God, or how God wants to be worshipped, except that He tells me. So again, I'm back to study to show myself approved unto God. In the area of worship, apply it just in that area alone. I have to study the Bible. I have to know how Jesus Christ, who is my Savior, wants me to worship God. 
And so you see in John 4, 24, the basic principles of worship taught by Jesus to the woman of Samaria. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And no certain place is there to worship God, save the authorization of the New Testament as to where worship is acceptable on the first day of the week. Now, I speak of the first day of the week. Because in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, it's where God's going to be worshipped. You can't go out here on the creek bank under a tree and say, I'll worship God. You don't have any authority from Jesus to do that. Well, yeah, but it feels good to me. Join Cain. You know what that got him. The very point that we're trying to make is whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. I don't act without authority of my king. He's my savior. He declared himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John 14 and verse 6. He said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. His authority is manifested in the words of the perfect law of liberty. James 1, 25. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So when I start thinking, well, I'll do this to praise God, but I have nothing in the word of God that tells me to do that, then I don't do it. We do according to the authorization. That's how we prove our love of God and our faith in God. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And as the Bible closed, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, Revelation 22, 8 and 9, we're told not to add to or take away from the Word of God. So I'm cautious to ascertain only that which is taught in the way the Bible teaches anything in words when it comes to these things. So these are duties to God. I have a duty then to do God's will. I have a duty to worship God. And man must extend the knowledge of God. I don't know that we understand that like we ought to. We talk about growing in the knowledge of God, growing in the faith of God, growing in the grace or favor of God. Well, that implies you at one point, you can be to a greater point in that area. It's important to realize that when you know the position of the Jewish people during the Mosaical Age, that 1,500-year period between Exodus chapter 20 and the cross of Christ, when the Jews out of all the nations were chosen people for a particular purpose at that time, and they had a law that was a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. They had, during what we call Old Testament times, the peculiar mission of the Jews to extend the knowledge of God. Sometimes we wonder, well, what, what were they to be doing? Well, if they lived like the law told them to live, they held God up before an unbelieving world and said, there is a God, and he is alive, <laughs> as the song says. And this God is the God you serve and nobody else. And they were to show that. Man has always sought to leave God from the beginning, you see it. Man has, by transgression, fallen from the grace of God. Man has always had the problem of saying, that's what I want to do, and I'm going to do it. Some people even boldly confess, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it like I want to. I have a good feeling about it, and I come from generations of people who have done the same thing. They were good people, so, you know, God will accept it. No, God won't accept any such thing simply because of that. So the church of our Lord today to be truly the church of Christ, the church built by Christ, purchased by his blood, has already said we will do the Lord's will no matter what. Whatever governments say that's contrary to the will of heaven, whatever our family says that's contrary to the will of heaven, we're going to obey God because that's how we form our characters in the likeness of Christ. That's how that we are faithful. That's how that we are spiritual. There's no other way to do it. Think about it for a moment. 
If you were to say, I'm going to show the world my great faith, belief, trust, and love of God, but I'm going to do it without obeying him, just how would you go about that? You couldn't. You couldn't at all. The only way you can show you love God is that you obey his will. Man's duty to God is basically summarized in this statement. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Now, there's nothing left out. You cannot serve God with reservations by saying, well, this area of my life I reserve to do with as I please. It won't work that way. It's all or none. A lot of people haven't understood that. They, they still, as we talked about in class this morning, have one foot in the world, one out, one in the church. And they're in constant turmoil because they see the need through the knowledge of the Bible they have to do God's will. But they love some things about the world and they know they love those things and they enjoy doing them. And so they'll just flip flop. And they're never happy at anything they do. They're con they have enough Bible for their conscience to, to bother them when they don't obey God, but they don't have enough faith to lead them to give it all up and obey God in all things at all times. That's why that this first commandment is so important in man understanding his duty to himself. But then notice man has a duty to his neighbor. Now, another place in the scriptures, uh, the question was asked, who is my neighbor? Uh, I realize we use the word term neighbor in different ways today. We can mean the person we rarely see, but has lived next door to us for 30 years. And we say, he's my neighbor. But that's not the way it was used when they asked him the question, who's my neighbor? And the Lord answered it with the account of the Good Samaritan. Here's the point. Who is my neighbor? Anybody in need. That's the reason that I may never see some people that I've treated scripturally very neighborly in other parts of the world because I've tried to send support to them where I could. I may never see them to get to heaven. That's the reason you don't have to be family with somebody, as we normally use that term, before he's your neighbor. You act neighborly toward people in the sense they have needs they can't fulfill. They're in dire straits for some reason or other, sick or whatever, and we're there to help them do what their lack of whatever cannot do. That shows then that a person is concerned about other people. There are a host of folks in this world are concerned about themselves, and if they happen to rub shoulders with somebody else, it's an accident, and they wish they hadn't. They don't want to get involved with other people. How in the world can you be a Christian and what the church's mission really is and what the work of the church is and not involve yourself with other people? So we must be mindful of God's love for our neighbor. It may come as a shock to some people, but God loves all these folks around here as much as he loves you or anybody else. When Christ died on the cross, he died for all these wicked people we read about. And we see on the news every day they're doing wicked things. Christ died for them. And if they were of the mindset and were taught the gospel, they could be saved as much as you can be saved. We need to understand that. And that's the reason Saul of Tarsus, having obeyed the gospel and being converted to Christ, could say that he had been chief of sinners. My, he openly opposed the church and arrested people that were Christians, causing them to blaspheme Christ and caused their death, held the clothes of the first of the people that killed the first Christian martyr, Stephen, and said, that's good, go to it, boys. He was right in the big middle of it. He had that kind of attitude, but you see, he did change. I guess we need to have the belief that if we present the gospel to people, uh, they may receive it like we did and actually change in the true sense of conversion. Now, maybe we can't get a hearing with them. I understand all of that. But look at the people that were converted in the book of Acts. Well, they were people we normally wouldn't think would be interested in the Bible study. I don't think many people today would think the Philippian jailer in an old Roman jail, as harsh as those people were, 
would have been a good candidate to hear and obey the gospel. I wouldn't think that many people today in such high station as the Ethiopian nobleman in charge of Candace, Queen Candace's treasure, that that person would be open to teaching the gospel to them. But when you look at Paul uh, as even in defending himself against the Jews, appeared before two governors and a king. And in the process of defending himself didn't do a thing in the world but preach the gospel to them. And he made one of them tremble. Now that doesn't mean everybody we preach to or teach or even people we try to approach will study the Bible with us. But it does mean the obligations upon us to so do if we're mindful of our neighbor and our, their needs and our responsibility to our neighbors. If people can have a house burned down and lose everything they've got and we don't know them from anybody and we contribute to helping them in that way, how much more so when their spiritual house is burned to the ground? They don't even recognize they had a spiritual house and it's gone. And aren't we expected as members of the church to do what we can to get them to see the truth of their spiritual situation, their separation from God, their lost condition? Certainly, we ought to take advantage of that if we can. But there's more than this. It's not just doing something to help the person who can't help himself. It's also... Being, uh, and I use it in the right way here, anxious to help his neighbor. Ready at all times to see the opportunities to help whoever it is that's in need. Uh, we are people who the Bible says are involved in good works. As the Bible tells us what those good works are for Christians. And the greatest I can think of is the fact the church is primarily a teaching institution. That we ought to be looking for every opportunity to teach something. may not mean you get to sit down and teach an hour of Bible study with somebody. It may mean, as our Lord did many times, just the passing word or two you get to say to make them think. We mentioned this morning in class and somebody says, oh, so-and-so is a good person. Look at the opportunity. Why do you call that person good? <laughs> make them think. People, you know, we, we hear a lot around here about thinking. And what the Bible has so much to say about thinking. The prophet said, come let us reason together. You can't do that without thinking. That is proper thinking. Sometimes people say, well, I've got to think about that for a while. I want to ask them, what are you doing in that a while? What do you call thinking? What does it involve thinking straight, thinking correctly? Well, we have an obligation to cause people to think. And many times they don't. We do that if we love our children and want to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We'll tell them things, but we'll think about that for a minute. Just think about that. What did Mama tell you? What did Daddy tell you? And what have you done? Now think about that for a minute. And, of course, we deal with them as children and on their level as children. But nevertheless, we still are trying to get them, as old saying goes, think before you act. So one must be very diligent, very anxious, looking for every opportunity to teach his neighbor. It's the idea of being instant in season. We're instant. Uh, we're ready to, to go after it. Man's duty to his neighbor is summarized in this statement. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, so man has a hidden duty to himself. Which leads us right into the next part. Man has this duty to himself. In other words, how can I love my neighbor if I don't have the proper love for myself? That's what it comes down to. If you don't have the love God expects you to have for yourself, you'll never be able to love your neighbor like you ought to. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, understand, that means I have to know how I should love myself. I don't know how to love myself independent of my creator telling me how to do it and what he means by it. So I'm back to study to show myself approved unto God to learn how to love myself. It's not some sort of sinful, selfish, self-willed, inconsiderate love that produces an arrogant, haughty, and conceited spirit. To the contrary, references to an attitude, and here's what it is, of proper, sane concern 
for one's own soul. When we preach the gospel to people, that's what we're appealing to them to do for themselves. Think about your own life. Think about your own soul. Where are you going with your life? You have the choice. As you're living right now, what's motivating it and guiding it? What's your chief concern? <clears throat> so that's the thing that we have to have about ourselves to be able to love our neighbor as ourselves. Proper regard for one's spiritual well-being. A lot of people don't know they ought to have that. But the person that's Christian must have some aspect of it. Not that we can't grow in it. How would you even care about preaching the gospel to every creature if you don't care about your own soul? Paul told Timothy that he should stay with the true doctrine and thereby he would save himself and those that hurt him. Well, there's nothing wrong with me wanting to save myself and letting that be the groundwork for what I choose in my life. I don't mind telling anybody when I was a teenager, I chose to preach because I want to save David Brown. We almost act like we're embarrassed to say, well, I really want to go to heaven myself and I want to be saved. Why, that was on my mind from the time I was a teenager. I didn't want to go to hell. And I knew enough about the scriptures then to say if I'm not saved by Christ and if I don't come to him on his own terms, I won't be, then I'm not going to heaven. That didn't set well with me then. It doesn't set well with me now. So that formed a lot of why I chose what I did. I've often said this over the years. If at 15, 16, 17 years old, not adolescent stage, a person can know the truth well enough to become a Christian and be concerned about the truth and knowledge of and obeying it, that shows you that though you're still somewhat of a child, you can make some very good decisions. And the greatest you can make is to choose to serve God, keep, you, keep his commandments. So when you have this kind of self-love, proper regard for one's spiritual well-being, there's something that comes out of that. The kind of self, this kind of self-love means one will recognize that he has an immortal soul. When we finish this life and this body's going back to the dust from whence it came, we'll be just as much of a reality and a personal entity in eternity as we are right now. We're not going to cease to exist and to be personally aware of things all around us and involved in it. It just won't be in this life. It'll be in a life of non-physical things and in a place that is non-physical. So we'll recognize that as we think about ourselves, that we do have an immortal soul. We'll really begin to appreciate the important things, the salient facts of life in the flesh and what we're to be doing with ourselves. We'll understand our obligation to God to save ourselves. Remember when Peter preached to the people on Pentecost when the church began, he pointed out, save yourselves from this crooked and untoward generation. Well, they couldn't author a plan of salvation, but they were individual persons who had a will. They had a mind. So receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, is what he's saying. Be honest with yourself and with God in the truth preached to you. Apply it honestly to your life and submit to whatever obligation God's laid upon you that you can be saved by Jesus Christ. There is self-love. And that self-love leads one to love God. For this brings benefits to himself, to his own spiritual well-being. And that will compel a person to love his neighbors we've been talking about. Well, that within itself even brings benefit to oneself. Actually, it's out of this proper consideration of our own souls, I said in the beginning, this self-love as we've defined it, that we meet our obligations, discharge our duties to God and to our neighbor. 
This, in the light of what we said, is the great controlling influence of the life of the individual person. The proper regard for one's own soul. And this self-love, therefore, is man's greatest responsibility. This is then man's duty to himself. This is what Christ is talking about here. We tried to milk it for everything it's worth to make the applications to challenge every one of us. So what is man's duty to himself? To have the proper regard for his own soul. And what will man's love for self cause? It'll cause one to meet his obligations to God and to his neighbor. So what should we conclude from all of this? Well, let each one of us determine to be characterized by his scriptural proper love to understand that this is truly man's duty to himself. And when that happens, the others flow from it. If you're not a child of God today, we urge you to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him as the Son of God and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. The Lord will therefore add you to his church and in it you'll develop in all these areas we've talked about today. As a child of God, if you've slipped being concerned about your duty to yourself, then we urge you to repent of that and renew it. Pray God for forgiveness having confessed those things. If you need to do that now, we urge you to come while we stand and sing.